But psychologist Jordan Peterson says things that so upset protesters. They try to prevent other people from hearing what he has to say. Go home, Peterson! Go home, Peterson! But other people flock to hear him speak and to buy his books in which he says, to find meaning in life, you must take responsibility. Some time ago, I made two short videos with Peterson. After those videos aired, many of you asked us to release our full interview. So here it is. Young men get excited when you talk to them about responsibility? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fancy that, eh? Who would have ever guessed that? I wouldn't have. No, no kidding, no kidding. Yeah, well, I did this series of biblical lectures in Toronto, and they concentrated on, imagine this as an invitation to a lecture, okay? We're gonna talk about the Old Testament. <laughs> we're gonna talk about the Abrahamic stories, right? In a really dark way. I'm gonna rent a theater and I'm going to invite young men to come. It's like, you think that's gonna be successful? And we're gonna talk about responsibility and truth. It's like, oh, they'll be beating down the doors to attend those lectures. And well, they all sold out. They sold out and how did the excitement manifest? People have been fed this diet of pablum rights and impulsive freedom for so long. Free tuition. Making quality childcare affordable. You have a right to a living wage. There's a, just an absolute starvation for the other side of the story. There are no rights, technically speaking, without responsibilities. And all we've had for 60 years is a dialogue about rights. Well, that leaves a hole on the other side of the story. That, and it's a hole that, that's in people's hearts, essentially. Because responsibility well, perhaps that's not more important than rights. Like I said, they're, they're part and parcel of the same formula. But it's in responsibility that most people find the meaning that sustains them through life. It's not in happiness. It's not in impulsive pleasure. Those things blow away at the first ill wind. But to adopt the responsibility for your own well-being and to try to put your family together and to try to serve your community and to try to seek for eternal truths and to live them, that's the sort of thing that can ground you in in your life enough so that you can withstand the difficulty of life. And when you tell people that, especially when you include yourself in the audience, let's say, and you're not finger-waving from above, then everyone knows that it's true. There's been this attempt to identify masculine competence and, and power, let's say, but mostly competence with tyranny. The problem is toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. And that's very, very hard on on young men, it's also hard on young women for that matter, but it's very helpful for people to hear that they should make themselves competent and dangerous and take their proper place in the world. Competent and dangerous? Mm -hmm. Why dangerous? Because it's the alternative to being weak. And weak is not good. The people who shoot up the high schools, they're weak. They're weak. How is it good to be dangerous? Because it makes you formidable. And life is a very difficult process and it's not for you're not prepared for it unless, unless you have the capacity for, to be dangerous. That doesn't mean that you should be cruel. It doesn't mean any of that. There's a statement in the New Testament, the meek shall inherit the earth, but the meek isn't well translated. It means something more like those who, those who have swords and know how to use them but keep them sheathed will inherit the world. That's a way better way of thinking about it. You have to be powerful and formidable and then peaceful in that order, right? And that's not the same as being naive and weak and harmless, which is what young men are being encouraged to be. It's like, that's a very bad idea. It's a very bad idea. Because naive, weak, and harmless means that you can't withstand the tragedies of life. You can't bear any responsibility. You'll end up bitter. And when you get bitter, then you get dangerous. From Vox, <laughs> claimed, feminists have an unconscious wish for brutal male domination. You tell me why they line up with the Islamists because they line up with the Islamists, and not all do, they just haven't criticized them. Well, that's good enough for me. You know, you'd think if the, if the feminists practiced what they'd preached, there'd be non-stop demonstrations against Saudi Arabia. Saudi women, they still cannot get married, travel abroad, or open a bank account without permission of a male guardian. You say compassion is a vice? If it's taken too far, you don't treat adult men as if they're infants. You don't divide the world into victim and oppressor and then assume that all the moral virtues on the side of the so-called victims. It's an extension of the infant predator narrative as far as I can tell. Now you're either an infant or a predator. Well, that's just not a good way of conceptualizing the political world. There's an entire 
what literature, psychoanalytic literature, on the dangers of overcompassion, hyperprotectiveness, helicopter parenting, all of that. When you have children, you have to encourage them. You have to encourage them to take risks because they have to grow up and take their place in the world. You can't protect them too much because if you do, you destroy them. That's the motif of Hansel and Gretel, right? Two kids lost in the woods. They find the gingerbread house. That's a little bit too good to be true, right? It's not only shelter when you need it, but it's candy. What lives inside the house that's too good to be true? The witch that devours you, right? That's excess compassion. So you don't want your mother to do everything for you. That's for sure. There's a rule if you're dealing with the elderly and like extended care homes, don't do anything for your clients that they can do themselves because you undermine their autonomy. And so there's a certain amount of harshness that goes along with that, just as there is if you're a good mother, because you have to separate yourself from your child and allow them to make hurtful mistakes, right? I mean, it's, it's very difficult if you're a compassionate person to stand back far enough to let your children take necessary risks. But one thing I'm not getting, there's a big difference between letting people do something for themselves mm -hmm. and saying men should be dangerous. Mm -hmm. By dangerous, that implies I should be ready to threaten someone, to hurt somebody. No, you should be capable of it. But that doesn't mean you should use it. There's nothing to you otherwise. Like if you're not a formidable force, there's, not, there's no morality in your self-control. If you're incapable of violence, not being violent isn't a virtue. People who teach martial arts know this full well, right? If you learn a martial art, you learn to be dangerous, but simultaneously you learn to control it. Both of those come together. And the combination of that capacity for danger and the capacity for control is what brings about the virtue. Otherwise, you confuse weakness with, with moral virtue. I'm harmless, therefore I'm good. It's like, no, that isn't how it works. That isn't how it works at all. If you're harmless, you're just weak. And if you're weak, you're not going to be good. You can't be, because it takes strength to be good. It's very difficult to be good. And your critics, your female critics say, you men are already stronger than we. You abuse us, and you're encouraging that. No, oh, well, that's definitely not the case. I mean, I've had tens of thousands of people write me now and say that, you know, they've taken my message to heart. They were nihilistic or addicted or aimless or having trouble in their relationships or not moving forward with their partners, their wives or girlfriends. And they've been trying to develop a vision for their life and to take responsibility and to quit using deceit. And they're better for it. And there's no downside to that for anyone, men and women alike. And most of the reason that men have been coming to my lectures is I think part of that's just an arbitrary baseline fluke. Almost all the people who watch YouTube are men. It's like 80%, 75, 80%, it's about the same for me. So it might be that my message is particularly attractive to young men, or it might just be that, you know, I was particularly popular on YouTube and that's mostly a male domain. Yeah, it's popular with young men because you're saying, yeah, go ahead. Abuse women. <laughs> no, I've never said anything like that. And I think that that's... that's it's okay to absolutely. hate trans people. No, it's not okay particularly to hate anyone, maybe even your enemies. And, I, and my, what I've talked about has virtually nothing to do in any real technical sense with trans people. The stance I took on Bill C-16 was an anti-compelled speech stance. And I, I stand by, by it. Government. Absolutely. There has never been a piece of legislation in the history of the English common law that compelled private speech. Not once. There has been legislation that compelled commercial speech. So, for example, if you sell tobacco, you have to put a warning on the product. But that's commercial speech. It's very, very limited. And even that's been extraordinarily limited. The Supreme Court in the U.S. in the 1940s came out and stated forthrightly that there was to be no compelled speech uh, generated by the, legis by the legislative and the executive branches, that that was unconstitutional. And it violates English common law tradition. And the fact that it has to do with transgender people is virtually irrelevant. The issue is compelled speech. And if it wasn't the issue, this would have died away. All the scandal surrounding this would have died away 18 months ago. It's not what it's about. It's about the government and the ideologues that are pushing this sort of legislation, attempting to uh, exercise uh, tyrannical control over voluntary speech. And that's a no-go zone as far as I'm concerned. So somebody wants to be called Z or Zer. Why not? I don't care what people want to be called, that's fine, but that doesn't mean I should be compelled by law to call them that. The government has absolutely no business whatsoever, ever, governing the content of your voluntary speech. Like, I don't even like hate speech laws. I think they're a big mistake. And that says what you can't say, right? 
This is what you have to say. That's a whole different, that's a whole different ballgame. So ball you were game. personally willing to accommodate people if they want to be called something odd? We could have a conversation about that and if I was convinced that you knew why you were asking that was actually in your best interest that, and you weren't just attempting to exercise ideological control over me for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with you personally, then I might consider it in my private conversation, just like I would if you asked me to use a nickname, for example. So, but there's a big difference between privately negotiated modes of address and legislatively demanded compelled speech. It really has nothing to do with transgender people or except peripherally the transgender issue. It's complicated because the legislation that I objected to also writes a social constructionist view of human identity into the law. Social constructionist? Nobody knows what that means. It means it's, it's the theory that underlies the proclamation that gender identity is only a social construct, is only something you learn, it's only a performance, that it has no grounding in biology. That's wrong. Now it's written into our law. Why is it wrong? Lots of people believe this. If it weren't for our sexist society, we'd be much more alike. That's actually not the case. The science on that is absolutely clear. So as societies become more egalitarian, and this is mainstream science, by the way, this isn't pseudoscience, this is mainstream science, and, it's, and it was discovered by people who are basically liberal or left-leaning, so it went against the grain, which is part of the reason why it's actually reliable. As societies become more egalitarian, the differences between men and women increase rather than decreasing, and that happens for personality. It happens for spontaneous interest, like the, the, the domain of your interest, which is basically people versus things. And it happens for the probability that women will enroll in STEM fields. So the more egalitarian the society, the lower the probability that women will enroll in STEM fields. And that runs contrary to, well, contrary to the desires of the researchers who generated the data, because no one wanted that. It came as a shock to everyone, but that's how it is. That's what they found. And, and those papers have been cited, they've studied tens of thousands of people in dozens of countries, and the papers have been cited thousands of times. And yet when you say this, it infuriates some people. No, it should infuriate them because I'm going right after the heart of the radical leftist doctrine. So it's no wonder they're infuriated. The radical leftist doctrine which is? Well, partly it is that human identity is purely learned. And the reason that radical leftists believe that is because they believe that if there's no central human nature, then human beings can tr be transformed sociologically, politically, in, into the image that the radical leftists would prefer. Which would be? Oh, God only knows, you know, the new man or some bloody thing like that. The sort of thing that the, the communists were touting back in the 1920s. The re reshaping of society on an egalitarian basis with equality of outcome for everyone. All these unbelievably pathological and, and, and divisive and deadly ideas. And so for challenging this, they call you a transphobic piece of shit. Yeah, that's one of the, they've called me lots of things. Hitler, that was one. I was either Hitler or Milo Yiannopoulos, and that was one of the, so which is quite the insult, eh? You're either Hitler or Milo Yiannopoulos. The bloody leftists, they can't even get their insults straight. And you look pretty calm while they're screaming at you. Yeah, well, you know, better to be calm. Most you said it's best to let the unreasonable opposition speak. Because they manifest themselves as unreasonable. Yeah, and then yeah, everyone yeah. can see it. But everybody doesn't see it. No, but lots of people see it. Um, the first video that, that I was featured in, let's say, that went viral, which has had about four million views, was taken by some protesters. They accosted me after a free speech rally at the University of Toronto that emerged after I made my videos objecting to Canadian legislation. And they videotaped it. They were calling me out on my hypothetically bigoted stance with regards to this legislation. And they put it online and like four million people have watched it and the comments are 100 to one negative. I mean, the protesters put it up because they thought it would discredit me, but that didn't work at all. And all the protests that have been leveled against me, some of which were quite ugly, especially the ones that I won at Queen's University, have had, I would say, exactly the opposite effect of that which was intended ugly because it was dark um, we were in a hall um, it was kind of a church-like hall there was about 900 of us that had come to to hear myself and another professor speak and the hall was lined with stained glass big stained glass windows probably 10 feet high and the protesters say 10 of them along the one side the protesters climbed up on the window wells and pounded on them like quite forcefully for 90 minutes and so from inside one of them 
pounded on the window hard enough to break it and, and cut herself and left blood on the window. And she was later arrested carrying a garrote, which was not exactly, um, that's not exactly a defensive weapon. Anyways, so for everybody inside, all we could see were these shadowy figures against the stained glass pounding away, you know, and the, chant, the protesters outside were chanting such things as barricade the doors and burn it down, which uh, if you know anything about 20th century history and about the fact that those sorts of things happen, then that's not exactly the sort of thing that's acceptable to be pronounced at a protest. So it was a creepy, creepy, dark, protest and no, nobody that was in that hall, 900 well-behaved university students who had come to hear a lecture, nobody who was in that hall is going to soon forget that. About three quarters of a million people have watched it now. The genesis of this from Marxism and speaking your truth, can you talk about that? The campus situation, which is now spilling over into broader society and driving some of the political polarization that characterizes the West is uh, the consequence of the, of the hegemony, I would say, to use a favorite Marxist expression, of radical leftists in the university. And that came about for complicated reasons. I don't think we understand all of them, but it's partly an amalgam of neo-Marxist thinking and, and postmodernist thinking, French postmodernist thinking. It's a little discredited now to say I'm a Marxist. Yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Except I think it's one in five social scientists identify as Marxist. So yeah, it's a little discredited, but it's nowhere near discredited enough. It should be as discreditable to say that you're a Marxist as it is to say that you're a Nazi, given what we know about the absolutely deadly consequences of the implementation of Marxist doctrine. This is a real issue, eh, is that like, we know the left can go too far. Everyone knows that. And there's a reason for there to be a left wing. The, the left speaks for people who are dispossessed. They're speaking up for the weak. Yeah. Men run most of society, they're defending women. Trans people are often horribly punished, discriminated against. Yeah, well there's... So you're a bully. There's no doubt that you need someone to speak up for the dispossessed, but that doesn't mean you get to play identity politics. And identity politics just invites a division into tribalism on the right and the left. Because the right plays identity politics too, you know, I would say more in reaction, but it's not a good game. It's not a game that anyone will ever win. It's a game you play if you want everyone to lose. Identity politics is a little vague for people. What's the harm? It's saying, they're saying, shut up. You men dominate everything anyway. And you're just making it worse, worse for weak people. First of all, I think the idea that like men tyrannically dominated everything is a pretty damn weak argument. It's like you look around, I mean, I'm always amazed coming to a place like New York City. New York's an absolute miracle. It's impossible, this place, right? I mean, how many people come here a day? Seven million? It's fundamentally peaceful. Everything works, right? It's rich beyond belief. Everyone is doing better here than anybody has ever done on the, on the face of the planet throughout recorded history. And the whole West is like that. And to call that all a per tyrannical patriarchy is indicative of a very deep resentment and a historical ignorance that's so profound that it's indistinguishable from willful blindness. So look, every society has its tyrannical aspect and nothing is perfect, but we do not so bad in the West. In fact, you know, we do better than any place has ever done. And not only that, the, the principles that govern the West and the capitalist principles, the free market principles, the idea of individual sovereignty above all else has distributed itself across the world quite effectively and everyone is getting richer, everyone. From 2000, the year 2000 to the year 2012, the rate of absolute poverty in the world fell by 50%. It's like, that's pretty good for a patriarchal tyranny. That was the fastest economic development in the history of the world. You sound like a libertarian, are you? I wouldn't say that I'm primarily a political person. I definitely believe that the West's idea that the individual is sovereign over the group is the, the greatest idea of mankind. I truly believe that. And I think it's metaphorically and literally true. And I think that if you don't treat yourself that way and you don't treat the people immediately around you that way and you don't base your society on that principle that all hell breaks out very, very rapidly. And how does this phrase, speaking your truth, fit in? I have a rule in my book, which is rule eight. It says, tell the truth or at least don't lie. And it's really the last part of that, I think, that's better because, you know, well, what the hell do you know about the truth? You know, the truth is a very complicated thing. But people can tell when they're speaking deceitfully. You can tell now and then that what you're saying is actually a lie. It's a very good idea not to do that. There's a deep idea that's embedded in the biblical corpus, what would you call the narrative foundation of our culture. And the idea, it's, it's laid out in Genesis, two, two fundamental ideas. And one is that 
whatever God is, is the force that uses truthful speech to transform chaos into habitable order. That's the fundamental idea, and that that order is good. If truthful speech is used to generate the order, then the order is good. That's proposition number one. Proposition number two is human beings are made in the image of that power. And those propositions are correct, like they're correct metaphorically, they're correct psychologically, they're correct on multiple levels of analysis simultaneously. And so, if you lie, then you warp the structure of reality. We know this, this isn't some metaphysical doctrine. The great, the great scholars of the totalitarian systems of the 20th century, whether they were on the right or the left, point very, very directly to a relationship between the individual's willingness to subvert their own speech and to speak known lies and the totalitarian excesses of the state. Those two things are directly related causally. Truth is better, but you talked about the postmodern, I'm speaking my truth. There is individual truth, there's no doubt about that. I mean, you have your own experience and, and you can relate that in a way that's unique to you, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to inhabit a a truth that's universal simultaneously, because otherwise we can't stay in the same place at the same time. There has to be an overarching conceptual framework that we all agree on, or we can't exist peacefully. So if you don't want us to exist peacefully, then you can demolish the overarching framework and let everyone revert to their own personal truth. But all that means is chaos. You can't even run a household that way. I mean, you have your desires and, and what you need in your household, and so does your wife and the rest of your family members, but you have to engage in continual dialogue to organize that into something that's collectively inhabitable. Not if I'm speaking my truth. Well, you try that with your wife and see how far that goes. So it doesn't work locally or familially or, or socially. It's a form of narcissism to make that claim. And you say some people are scared now to speak up. Comedians won't go and, and play on university campuses anymore. So what do we do about that? I know what I did about it. I said I wasn't going to partake in it, you know. But I think what you do, to some degree, in your workplace and wherever you are, is you consult your own resentment. You will be asked to, to operate privately and, and, and productively under strictures that you can't really tolerate, that make you angry, bitter, resentful, out for revenge, because you're not allowed to. <clears throat> exist in the manner that you know is appropriate. You have to repress that and, and shrink away. It makes people very angry and bitter. And so you have to decide when people put unreasonable strictures on your behavior, whether or not you're going to put up with it and shrink, or whether you're going to take the risk of saying something and push back against that encroaching, let's call it politically correct tyranny. And I think part of your success is the left has gotten so comfortable with this dogma that they can't believe anybody disagrees. Mm -hmm. They can't believe anybody reasonable disagrees, right? Nazis disagree, but they're unreasonable. So anyone who disagrees must be a Nazi. Do you believe in equal pay? Well, I made the argument there. It's like it depends on so who defines it. So you don't believe it. in equal pay? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that at all. The British woman who disagreed with you, she was so unreasonable. And I think people like that you just answered her again and again. But nobody challenges them ever in their world. So conceptual worlds are set up so that the challenge isn't present. You know, these, these, the university disciplines that are particularly politically correct, like women's studies, are completely homogenous in their internal viewpoint. They've never heard these facts. First of all, they don't regard them as facts because, well, they don't regard science as an independent and valid discipline, let's say. They regard it as an extension of the oppressive patriarchy. And they're not all that interested in facts. They're interested in ideological completeness, let's say, and have a very uh, shaky grasp on, on history, especially the history of the 20th century. You know, there, there are reasons for, for the leftist utopian vision. Inequality is a painful reality, right? And every system that we know generates inequality. It's a real problem, at least the capitalist free market so system. So what's wrong with them saying, we have to fight this? Because there's no evidence that you reduce inequality by doing that. It doesn't help. Like, we don't know how to reduce inequality. And laying inequality at the feet of the, cap of the capitalist world or at the feet of Western society is, is ignorant, almost beyond comprehension. Inequality is a way worse problem than that. These are young people. Where they're so sure of themselves. Where do they get this? Oh, well, you can lay that primarily at the feet of the universities, as far as I'm concerned, the humanities and, 
and the social sciences, the humanities in particular, disciplines like women's and ethnic studies, which are corrupt right to the core and have been ever since their inception. They're ideologically motivated by their own admission. They're out to produce radical leftist activists by their own admission. All you have to do is go to the websites of these disciplines and look at how they advertise for new recruits. They feed students who are confused and often cynical, prematurely, and bitter, uh, an absolutely toxic ideological brew that's predicated on the idea that um, compassion trumps everything as a moral virtue and that society is essentially tyrannical. It's like society is tyrannical, but it's not essentially tyrannical. And compassion isn't the only virtue. And we don't know how to deal with inequality in any case. And the Marxist doctrine, despite its surface attractiveness, is clearly murderous. We've got a hundred million corpses stacked up to demonstrate that. Murderous then, but they say those Stalin is a bad individual. It doesn't mean that. Yeah, so was Mao, so was Pol Pot. The thing is, is it was tried everywhere under all sorts of different conditions by all sorts of different people with all sorts of different rationales and the end consequence was always the same. Look at Venezuela. Do you know it is now illegal in Venezuela to list starvation as the cause of death in a hospital? That's how the Venezuelan government is dealing with food shortages, right? They've made it illegal to diagnose starvation as the cause of death. It's like that pretty much sums up the Marxist doctrine. So if people, I've heard this all many, many times, that wasn't real communism. You know what that means? That means that if I would have been the benevolent dictator in, in the place of Stalin, then I would have brought in the utopia. There isn't a more narcissistic and toxic and inexcusable statement that you can possibly make. And what does communism have to do with you calling somebody by the name they want to be called? Well, what's paramount? Is it your group identity or you as an individual? And the collectivist claim is that the proper the mode of analysis is, is better. The group. So we're all in this together. People like that. Yeah, the, the collectivist idea is that the, the canonical element of your identity is your group, whatever that is. Now that's a problem because everyone fits into multiple groups, which is why intersectionality arose, right? Because that was the left's discovery of their own Achilles heel. But the fundamental claim is that, yeah, people are best conceptualized as part of their group identity and that you are obliged to respect that identity um, no matter what. And that drives in part these legislative moves that make address that takes into account group identity of paramount importance. So it's a tenuous connection, but it, the thread still the this, this thread still exists. It's connected at least in part through the doctrine of radical egalitarianism, right? The idea that equality out outcome is the, is, the, is the goal to be desired, even hypothetically, which of course is, it's wrong hypothetically and wrong practically for a variety of reasons. I mean, the first is you don't want to equalize across all possible dimensions of comparison because that would make everyone exactly the same in every possible way. And you can't imagine a situation that would be less <clears throat> commensurate with freedom and diversity, let's say, which is another of the left shibboleths than a society where everyone was compelled to be equal in every possible way. But people like that idea. We're all equal. Yeah, we're well, there's, a, there's truth to it in a sense. Like we're all equal before God. We're all equal before the law. But that's where it stops. And then we're as different as we can be after that. And then we actually want to be because you don't want to pursue the same things that I want to pursue. You don't want to succeed in the same way that I want to succeed. And you might say, well, we don't want there to be success because there has to be failure. You know, and that's a problem. That's the inequality problem. But is that really the case? Is you want to eradicate success as part of the price you pay for eradicating failure? No one lives that way. People might say that's what they want, but no one lives that way because if you eradicate success, then you have no impetus for action. What are you doing? Are you acting so that you'll fail? Is that, is that your motivation? Well, if you want to be motivated, which means if you want to have a purpose in life, like a purpose to set us against the suffering, then you have to be aiming at something where success is a possibility. And that opens up the landscape of success and failure. And there's pain associated with that. But that doesn't mean we eradicate the hierarchy of value itself and leave no one with anything to do. It's, it's a terrible doctrine in every way. And it's mostly motivated by resentment. Jumping to the happier part, 12 rules is unbelievably successful. It's probably sold 850,000 copies now if you include the worldwide market in two months. Number one on Amazon for a while. That almost never happens with nonfiction. Yeah, well, and it's also a difficult book. You know, it's a dark book as well. So it's not, it's not the sort of thing that you would expect people to line up to buy. 
So, but it's fundamentally an optimistic book.